Think of the Sex Pistols. In an age where Abba and Boney M ruled the charts alongside Gary Glitter and Mud, the Pistols' arrival was a breath of fresh air that blew away those sad disco cowboys. That breath of fresh air turned to the hustle of bad breath as the hype fueled bandwagon fell apart, leaving the media saying, Told you so. Critics pronounced punk dead, the movement went underground, and by 1980, fans spawned by the original punk phenomena were making a noise out of our own. Gone were the bad old days, where art school students were charged a fortune for dustbin liners in the King's Road, and here were the days where the music was being made by ordinary working class kids. One band of these working class kids came from Edinburgh, and went by the name of The Exploited. Surrounded by controversy from day one, this band has a history almost as notorious as Jack the Ripper. After forming in early 1980, this bunch of upstarts, led by ex-soldier Wattie Buchan, quickly got themselves noticed through their on-stage antics. Hard-hitting street rock anthems became the band's trademark, and constant gigging paid off for the band, as they soon found themselves supporting the likes of the Cockney Rejects and the UK Subs. The Exploited soon found their feet and on their own name label released their first single, Army Life. The B-side of this single featured a live favourite, Fuck The Mods, which was attacked by the music press as mindless due to the amount of gang warfare which was going on at the time. Nevertheless, this didn't stop the single reaching the top end of the indie charts. With a nationwide surge of street punk, journalist for the now defunct Sounds music paper, Gary Bushell, took the movement under his belt and named it Oi. Oi was about working class traditions and keeping the music where it belongs, on the streets. It warned of the dangers of a new generation of kids being left on the scrap heap. Um, first heard of the exploited through the Army Life single, which uh, what his uh, girlfriend Carol brought down to London to, uh, for me to hear. And I was really impressed by the the raw power of it, you know, the, the, the this was obviously a band who had something um, different about them, some energy, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of punch to it, and I thought, well, and the B side made me laugh. The old fucker mod thing was really funny. I, I just, you know, um, so I made it single of the week, I think, in sounds that week. The exploited staunch belief in anarchy stopped them from ever really becoming an oi band, though with a stigma attached to it after the well documented South Hall riot at an oi concert in 1981. This was probably a good thing. With the media blackout on oi and the rise of right wing musical activities, accusations that the band were fascists were made due to a fight with a gang of Asians in a motorway cafe and what he were wearing a swastika on stage. His argument that he just winds people up weren't accepted as justifiable on this occasion, and with gigs often turning into minor riots, arguments were raised about the morals of the band. The first two years, like, we were called like uh, a fascist band. Like, like, like it was really hard for us to get gigs, because uh, we used to wear like swastika arm bands and all that. Because like, it was just, it was just us like dress what you want. But it was not to do with like being a Nazi or fuck all. But as soon as you as soon as you get labelled like uh, a fascist band or an NF band, like, nobody wants to know ya. This didn't stop the band contributing two tracks to Bushel's first musical compilation, Oi The Album. I Still Believe In Anarchy and Daily News stood side by side with tunes from established bands like the Angelic Upstarts and the Cockney Rejects, as well as newcomers to the scene like the Sessue Babies. With a 
last able lineup of 20 stone giant guitarists, Big John Duncan, bass player Danny McCormack, and drummer Drew Sticks, the bands were headlining gigs of their own and building a phenomenal following, nicknamed the Exploited Barmy Army, after the second single. Paranoia Group, as the major music mags became interesting, placing Watty & Co on the front covers only months after abusing the band and the movement. This turned out to be a classic case of built up, not down. By the beginning of 1981, new bands like The Last Resort and The Business were rising, whilst The Exploited were being hunted by record labels, eager to cash in on their success. I first met them, uh, oh god, it was many, many years ago, uh, late 70s. Uh, I met them, I was running a company called Secret Records, which we'd set up as a, a punk label. And uh, I met the Exploited, they just had a, a record out called Army Life, which uh, was a you know, very successful record for them. Um, I think it actually went on to have something like five years in the independent chart without ever going out for a week, which was incredible. Um, and they were looking to move labels, and I was quite interested in them. I thought they had a lot of potential. And we signed them to the label, and then I took over as their manager as well. The first time I ever saw them play live, I just, was just gobsmacked. And I remember what he sort of making me stand behind the drums so that like people wouldn't actually hit me with anything. It was very strange, very strange. This was the dogs war. In March of 81, the band signed the secret record and within three weeks released their third single, Dogs of War, which peaked at the bottom end of the national charts. At the same time, a stunning live album was recorded in their hometown at the nightclub venue. Featuring all the singles plus more, on stage captures an atmosphere that can never be repeated and has never quite been captured in a live recording since. Verbal abuse between songs was aimed at everyone from the Edinburgh Police to Spandau Ballet, with a prize jive at Anaco Hippie Band Crash that started a war that ran for years and completely divided the punk movement. Can you say Crash? What his argument with Crass was that he wanted to live his life the way he wanted, not having to answer to anybody, regardless of the consequences. SBJ violence destruction! SBJ malice corruption! Fuck the SBJ! Get there, cunt! Come on! After a speed induced frenzy at a gig in Holland, and having been seen openly smashing two riot policemen's heads together after trouble at a gig in Germany, feelings towards the exploited were unanimous. Love them or hate them. Violence at gigs was becoming commonplace, and the exploited had their fair share of promoters who were scared to put them on a bill in case of trouble. The band themselves did nothing to ease this problem, and on certain occasions were known to join the crowd in trashing clubs. Uh, I tour managed them for about two years in all, uh, all over um, the UK mainly and little trips into Europe um, it was a pretty um, aggressive period that punk period there were lots of uh, problems there was all I mean it was the start of what ended up being a thrash metal thing with people jumping on stage but and diving off although that wasn't really happening then it just tended to be stage invasions and it was sort of um, fairly aggressive times I suppose um, Particular things that were uh, of interest were um, keeping them out of the way of the police, um, trying to keep them in hotels that they'd wrecked until it was sufficiently late in the day for them to leave. The sort of destruction that went along with that, was it was never done with, really particularly with any malice. It was always done with that sort of um, just horseplay, just fun, just having a good time. Um, it seemed to be necessary to take things from hotels. It was part of it, you know. People were through televisions out of hotels. I don't particularly remember that happening. I remember um, marble plinths with bowls of flowers, six foot high, ending up in the back of a minibus, you know, where they'd 
just carried them out of the hotel when they left, wrapped in a duvet from the hotel. It was just, just done for the hell of it, you know. If if the painting if a painting in a hotel room was screwed to the wall, they'd unscrew it and take it away. If it was just hanging there, they probably wouldn't go. It was just idiocy, but fun, really good fun, really enjoyable. <laughs> Punk's Not Dead, the band's first studio album, was released to Max Critical Acclaim, breaking into the national charts and being voted top independent album of 1981 by Sounds. The album contains studio versions of most of the live album, plus some brand new tracks, Free Fight, Son of a Copper, and a classic studio row between Gary and Big John over the arrangement of Blown to Bits. SPG and Royalty showed the band's attitudes towards authority and the royal family, while sex and violence pleased fans and horrified non-fans. The band's first headline tour was the now infamous Apocalypse Now Tour, teaming up with Discharge, Anti Pasty, and Cron Gen. This tour really helped put punk back on the map and wage war on the establishment. Still constantly gigging from one end of the country to the other, paved the way for the next single, Dead Cities, to crash straight into the top 30, selling over 150,000 records and moving an unearthly appearance on top of the pops, which the BBC now claim we have no record of the band ever appearing on this show. So starting to do very very well and they had an appearance on top of the pops which was just hysterical i mean it was quite ridiculous and i think a lot of their fans thought at the time that they were selling out and they just missed the point that they were just totally taking the piss and uh, the single was selling very well and the day, i always remember the day before we did top of the pops they sold 15,000 singles in one afternoon and the day after top of the pops was aired they sold 50 <laughs> That was, uh, it was one of the, it was probably the only group that sold less records a day after than the day before. What did uh, you make of the Top of the Pops appearance? Um, oh, that was, that was quite amazing, really. I mean, the single came out, Dead Cities came out, and it sold an incredible amount and charted, and then it was, oh, we want them on Top of the Pops. Um, went along there, the, the probably... I mean, they did set it up very well. They set it up with explosions and pyrotechnic devices and everything to go with it, which was very good on, on behalf of Top of the Pops. Um, the, some of the most difficult things was trying to keep Big John, the guitarist, you know, who was about 22 stone there with a bright green Mohican, from joining in with Legs and Co on the dance floor. We had to try and keep him back all the time. He wanted to be part of that. And they were doing the Birdie song at the time, which made it even worse because it was the most puerile thing. Um, but it went very well, uh, surprisingly well. I mean, it completely stopped the record selling, as far as I remember. <laughs> Everybody went, everyone on top of the pops, I'm not buying that. And it killed it stone dead, but it was still a wonderful experience to do it with, uh, with a band like that. Not, you don't get many of those chances. <laughs> no, but at the time, we talked pops, like, we got slagged off in the paper, no, in the papers there. Eh? We got slagged off a lot, saying like, oh, fucking was sold out because we'd be on top of the pops. We were, we were the last punk band that was on top of the pops. And like it was only, only, only we thought like we never if we'd never done it, then we'd never get then we wouldn't get to uh, to show people there's there's the punk still alive here. Eh? So we done it. And like they don't, don't really regret it. I do it in a way but I don't but in the other way I don't. Because well, it was good to have done. It's, it's good to have done but like uh, I mean, if the chance came up again, I'd do it again. But what are what are the regrets you've got? Regrets for that. One of the regrets for people like, like, like split a lot of their following up there. Some are following for like other. Uh, they're on TV. This like and they're getting like more people come to the gigs because they're either sold out because they're playing bigger venues. But, uh, but so that wasn't true. Eh? But that was just that was just like no, not a lot, but one or two. Eh? They gave the press a field day because they were trying to spot the punk movement up through punk, like for like, exploited like, like Anarchy and Chaos and through empty crashes like Anarchy and Peace Shutter. Eh? It's like when we first started, we had a fucking massive local kid following, right? And it's like when you signed to it, you get any good press for that, you get a kill, you start getting a bit bigger. The people that followed you from the beginning, they, they think that, uh, like, oh, you're sold out, eh, because you're in the papers or you didn't play in a bigger venue. Yeah, but it's like, it's just like shit. 
a lot of the bands, you th some of the bands, do you think they're too too good? I mean, they, they changed the music like well, Blitz and that. They changed the music totally and did a big like skinhead following. They just can't do it. Eh? It's just like it's like like your our albums. Like, when we do our albums, like I might have one or two songs and that might be a bit a bit different, like faster or a slow one, just to. But, like, but it'll still be in, it'll still be in the same theme as like what they exploited and what we're, what we're into. I mean, you got to, I mean, you got to remember that people. If they, like, I always feel like if I, if I, if I like something, if I play, we do a record and like, and if I like it, then that's how I judge like the people will like it because I know if I like it, they'll like it. But if I was going to do something completely different, I'd fucking I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put it under the name of exploited because it just you'd just be exploiting the people. I mean, because if you buy it, thinking it was exploited, they'll buy it. And when you hear it, it's a totally different music. It's like, I, I, like, rave, I like rave music. I like a lot of raves. No, over here in Holland, eh? But like, that's where they got the Gabba, fucking, like Nightmare and fucking, Nightmare in Rotterdam and stuff. I like the hardcore, the like, uh, rave stuff. But I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't bring out an album with all, all rave stuff and put it under the exploited, eh? But I could if I was a cunt, but I wouldn't. I'm a cunt, but I wouldn't put it out. <laughs> <laughs> To the top of the pops appearance, Anarchy Spain Pompey join the attack on the exploited by bad mouthing them whenever possible and writing a song for their debut album called Exploitation, claiming you don't need to go on top of the pops to get your message across. This pushed the rift in punk even further and has never been settled to this day, despite many pitch battles between the Barmy Army and the conflict crew. Attention was now being paid to the band's drug and alcohol abuse, and aging pop star David Bowen, intrigued by the maniac lifestyle of the band, turned up backstage and was seen drinking till dawn with three of the band in a London club. The Dead Cities tour, which took the band to most of Europe as well as an extensive UK tour, finished at the headlining gig at London's Rainbow Theatre, where the band hit more controversy when at the end of the set what he suggested the crowd go fuck them on, knowing full well the jam were playing only a few hundred yards away at the Michael Sobel Sports Centre. After the double A-side single, Alternative Attack, came the Troops at the Moral album, the title track of which was penned by the Vibrators. With a cartoon sleeve that was pure heavy metal imagery, the music had also hardened, with a guitar sound not that far away from the Pistols Bollocks album. Packed with terrorist style sing-along choruses and fast guitar riffs, the album went straight into the top ten on the national chart, reaching a peak for the band's success. very sort of small budgets that had what they've made up for you know that what they'd lacked in sort of technical performance they'd made up for in energy and enthusiasm but we wanted to they were starting to write a lot better songs uh, and we decided that you know it was time to make to make people set up and take notice and really show exactly what they can do so we invested a lot of money in those days I mean thousands and thousands of pounds and uh, and we put them in a really good studio, and uh, and they recorded. I mean, I still think it's an absolute classic album. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but that was a lot of fun because I think at the time they were also in a situation where they were suddenly realizing just what they could achieve, and uh, they were enjoying it more every day. It was it was a good experience, and it was nice to see a group coming out of themselves and realizing shit, we can really do this. Yeah. It was, it was good, yeah. but it, it didn't stop the fun either. Yeah. What are you still handcuffing girls to sort of the entrance way of the studio? I mean, it was, it was good. The following single, Computers Don't Blunder, saw an awareness of nuclear destruction that was to stay with a band to this very day. Whilst the B-side, Addiction, gave a non-glamorous account of the dangers of drug abuse. The first US tour was a six weeks coast to coast affair, which also took in Canada. On the band's return, disturbing reports that what he was receiving star treatment hit the grapevine, causing a great amount of unrest in the camp. 
with bands like the Exploited being used as pinups and given almost pop star treatment and punk's dwindling success. One time friend and icon of sewer Gary Bushy turned his back. Punk was always supposed to be about uh, thinking for yourself, doing things for yourself and doing your own thing. And too many people become clones and too many people were just going through the motions and, and singing the same old things, the same old chord structures over and over again. And I thought, well, this ain't what it's supposed to be. It just turned in, it's as sad as seeing a, like a teddy boy now. You know, it just it lost, it lost its point and they'd forgotten what it was all about. And it wasn't just to become another fashion or another pose. It was about to, you know, uh, making a statement about yourself and, and developing yourself. I mean, punk was about individuality and it had become a uniform. This one article rocked the foundations of punk from which it never really did recover. Be it that punk was only a fashion to some, or that people realise music can only create awareness and not change is unknown. But from that day, it was an uphill struggle for bands like The Exploited to survive. Concert violence at an all-time high, with right-wing skinheads being blamed for smashing up punky. The exploited, with their reputation preceding them, took the brunt of concert halls closing their doors to punk and skinhead fans. New drummer Danny, who'd taken over from Drew Sticks, was crumbling under the pressure. He was replaced by what his brother, Willie. Sticks, incidentally, was later sentenced to seven years imprisonment for armed robbery. Never too proud to drink at the bar of a gig and talk to the crowd, the exploited were also known for smuggling in people who couldn't afford entry fees and, much to the annoyance of their fans, pulling out of gigs at the last minute because of promoters charging extortionate entry prices to gigs, thus gaining the label unreliable as well as dangerous. When secret main man Martin Hooker left the label, the band were disillusioned with the company's direction and left. Due to various contracts being signed when the band were naive, unseen unofficial t-shirts and compilation albums started to barely exploit his name. Without a decent label, owed over £2,000 from the first record and allegedly not paid in full by secret, the band themselves were being exploited. Well, Peter Parson, his manager's uh, DRI and stuff, he's like, he was his money, he's in for a fucking kicking as well from coming to the States. So was a... Uh, Mark, what's his name? Malcolm Forrester. But Sim ripped us off for uh, fucking all that money in the past. And like we couldn't get a uh, couldn't get a lawyer or fuck all because like in the business in the business the record what business that can't get you can't get a lawyer eh, because all that money up front. So like uh, he fucked us over for he's, well, he's fucked us over for at least eight years. But uh, that's just life he got on with. But, but no, but like, like record-wise and that, like, like I know what I'm doing. I've got more control over what, what, what's happening. So we don't get exploited like we did in the past. Because like, they, they bring in records, like look, they bring in old records, they bring records and stuff. And we're like, we don't want them to bring them out because they've already been out. And they bring them out and bring them to cash and make money, yeah? And it's fucking shit. So you have no control over what comes out of your back catalogue if you... No. No? No, because they can't just do what they want. But we have now, we control it, we control it now. We've got control now, but in the past we never had any control. And there were all these bootlegs, like totally exploited. Like, and there's like, like well, there was four or five bootlegs. Right, the only, only, only way we could get back at them is to fucking like, visit them. The master offices up here and fucking threaten them. And they, like, and they, sometimes it works, sometimes like, we, they never. <laughs> Label this, the band were contacted by indie label Paxi Boss, Marcus Beverly, who had known the band for some years previously. The band signed the Pax for an album and a single. Bassist Gary quit the band and was replaced by ex-Crutees member Billy. Gary went on to form various free techno bands with limited success. Ironically, at the same time, Big John had had enough and decided to leave but not before recording the Rival Leaders EP and Let's Start A War album. The album was panned by sounds writer and oil poet Gary Johnson, accusing the band of not being worthy of their place at the top of the punk tree. What his obsession with nuclear holocaust and dying for the government's convenience was rife in most tracks. The 
B-side of the EP featured a track called Sing Along a Bushel, dedicated to Gary Bushel, and with the chorus being plainly, wanker. Sing Along a Bushel, well, I understand why they did it, and I think it was genuine. I mean, I was seen as a traitor for having said that punk was dead, but what people didn't realise was I'd said punk was dead because punk was getting stale. So I don't know what it was, when well. we just like, we started writing, doing articles about bands, but you'd, you'd go under the name Jerry Harris, you didn't, didn't have a boss, you'd like, slag it and say like, wait a sec, a review of the exploiting gig and just like, slag you off and all that fucking shit, really crap and that, and he wasn't even there, he just made it up, right, and so that's why, I, that's why in the end we wrote a song about him, yeah, because I thought he was fucking being really two-faced. Is there any evidence or proof that that was him? Because I, 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 I know it was him. Who is Jerry Harris? Jerry Harris, Jerry Harris. Jerry. He was a writer. Did he? He was a, uh, a punk writer, beginning of the eighties, wasn't he? Yeah. Didn't he write for Sounds and probably that punk magazine? Yeah. No, doing the research for this, uh, I thought it was you writing under another name. No, I wasn't yeah. Jerry Harris. No, I know he was. You don't have to start my dogs. Don't turn for riot. Don't have to the upstarts. Don't to cop the rejects. Don't to all the bands. Don't to sham. I mean, it's just his way of getting back. Fuck, I don't know, I don't know why. Maybe because like, like, we didn't really like, agree with everything he said. But, but, but even saying that, I'm not, I'm not fucking, I have nothing against the guy. I mean, he did a lot for us. And, like, I mean, like, not, I'm, not, I'm not going, I didn't, I respect him for what he done. But, uh, but in the end, like, I thought he was a, a shit thing that he done, eh? But then that's life he just got on there. As Bushel himself worked up the ranks to his current position at the Sun, the exploited themselves seemed stuck in the twilight world of the seedy venues in which they were playing. From tiny clubs and halls, through to major London venues and then back again. The exploited had turned full circle. Bushel was right. The exploited may destroy themselves, but they'd never sell out. What is belief and practice if keeping on the same level with the fans had earned him respect? A nationwide hunt for a new guitarist found Carl Morris from Bolton, with Billy also being replaced by Wayne. The UK tour ended in disappointment for London fans when a hundred club bait was cancelled, but still advertised by the club. By 84, Bushman's prophecy had come true. Punk rock was chasing its own towel. Exploited imitators were shouting the same message without treading any new ground, and tartan bondage trousers were available at your local ice street store. The exploited themselves were off touring the world, spreading a message of revolt. And as the UK punk circuit became smaller and smaller, the worldwide market was becoming bigger than ever, with the exploited being at the top of the tree. Misplacing trust in Feverly, the band were ripped off again when he ran up for the takings from the Let's Start a War album. Yet more controversy hit the band when it came to light that they'd used American artist Pusshead's artwork for the album cover without paying him and rubbing off his name. In 85, a massive tour of Britain with the UK subs culminated at London's Lyceum in a six-act bill including 999 and the English Dogs. Around the time Bob Geldof was putting together Band-Aid, what he himself was writing horror epics, the song attacking Western apathy towards third world countries and the title track for an album released by Connection Records in 1985. Again covering nuclear destruction, as well as attacking the social security system and the police, they managed to sum up their feelings towards the government in an explicit song entitled Maggie. Co-produced by Watty, the sound was a new direction for the band and received a rare rave review in sounds. Whilst pop stars who believed they had more power than the government played benefit after benefit and gained increased album sales, the exploited continued to confront real social issues warned of four years before, with little or no interest from the press. The pressure of touring toll and an alleged on-stage fight between Watney and Carl in the US put pay to that liner. With Wayne also leaving, two vacant places were filled by ex-Combat 84 and UK sub-bases Deptford John and Mick, who mysteriously disappeared not long afterwards, on guitar. The poorly recorded Live at the White House album, recorded on the 85 US tour and featuring the previous lineup, was the next release. Featuring all the band's hits, it also contained a provocative slander of Jello Biafra of the US punk band The Dead Kennedys 
and another of what is arch enemies. Chop your Uh, can't remember though. Maybe we could, maybe come back to me later on. Uh, I can't remember what the fuck it was about. I can't remember now what it was about. <laughs> so many things have crossed on with like, uh, I've got a lot of respect for like, what it's trying to do to the record. But there's a lot of things they've done as well that I disagreed and lied there. Uh, they said that like, uh, all the money that they gave out and they done this and done that. We done let's start a war. And that was recorded in their studio. But what they've done is they've got their friend. The studio's in their friend's name. Mm. But it's not the band that's in the friend's name. And so it's, so they don't get the combat. But they, but they, they don't make a fucking good money. can't remember how much. But they're making fucking good money. Mm. Kind of so that way they were lying. They, could, they were lying to the kids as well. Eh? I just hate liars. So I respect Crass compared to bands like Conflict. Conflict's like <laughs> total shit like. Mm. Well, what, what is your opinions on him? Well, complex, yeah. just shit. Like it's, they reform, it's like they, 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 they just preach that much shit. It's all lies. Like uh, they put, 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 like they jumped on the cross bandwagon, right? And it was like, and then they started putting all this literature about animal rights and all this type of thing. And then they believe like the like anti drug bust. Have you got busted? Like sending your, uh, what you call it, sending some money, right? And they don't pay your fines. Kind of like we demonstrate on demonstrations. No, all the only thing they ever done was just buy drugs with it, went to buy some drugs and clothes. They fucking lying cunts. I just, I just, I just I really fucking hate them because like, a lot of people believed in them, right? And a lot, right, believed what they were about and they're just like total shit. Like they said that they wouldn't, uh, they'd never ever do like big venues or that. We never, never play for like so much. They'd never, they'd never charge as much. They'd never play these, these venues. We were touring the States and we're playing the same venues as, as us. We were talking like big, big, big venues. And they're charging the same money, eh? So everything that used to be right, it's just like, it's total shit. But it's too good, too, maybe, it's, maybe it take a while, like I say, it takes a while. But then when the kids come to see a second time, whatever, like they, can, they can tell you if you're talking to me, talk to them. They can tell if you're genuine or if you're, or if you're just a fucking liar. That's what I can roll with, it's like, they're, uh, there's, a big, there's a big, like, independent uh, paper that covers music for all in the world, yeah? And really big. And like we just look, look uh, say that we were Nazis and that. We always get this everywhere, like the spot of the Nazis. And, the <laughs> and then uh, they did put this uh, spot of the Nazis and like blah, 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 blah. But everything they wrote was fucking total lies. So we asked, we, I phoned them and asked them, well, did, well why don't you come and do an interview and meet the band and fucking find out the real facts. But it just continued, it just continues over the years to put, just put it shit. Yeah, so that, uh, well, fuck, I mean, it's like, so they don't, like, they're just like fucking assholes, just like, don't they, don't they like, take right about bands that like fucking, like, fucking like their, like their asses, you know, like, like he, he was in the paper saying that he had to be paid, but the songs that's in the, like, spotted ripped him off, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, it was a shit, it was lies, it was lies, boy. he might have been ripped off at the time, I, we, I thought he'd been paid, so, and when I was asked, I was telling him, he's been paid, he's talking shit, Marcus, but Marcus, obviously Marcus had bumped us, he, there's no much chance of paying him. And, that, and that's what it came down to, yeah? But like, there's no, there's no argument, like, I've not got any arguments with us here. Maybe, maybe, it's just through like, uh, people telling lies, eh? Once again. Like. But now, uh, now looking back at times, I think some, I used to always think I was right all the time about things, I never done that, I never done this. But, some, but uh, sometimes I was, uh, I wasn't right, I was wrong. Uh, well, I just, 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 I Involved in brawls and being arrested in just about every country there is, the exploited continue to tour the world and also make regular appearances at the Hundred Club in Oxford Street, London, after being banned from there some years earlier.
On one of these appearances, they were supported by Big John's new band, the Blood Uncles, who dissolved after a creative dilemma with Virgin Records. Further setbacks hit the band when their rehearsal room was broken into. Over a thousand pounds worth of equipment was stolen, leaving the band with only a microphone to their name. On the US leg of their world tour, their bus was desecrated by the anti-punk brigade. They, on the road, I mean, they were... Uh, they were probably, in some ways, a nightmare to deal with. And in other ways, they were extremely well behaved. They would all. They were very professional. They'd always be at the place on time. They'd always be up on time. They'd, all, you know, those sort of things. They were brilliant. Much better than groups that I have to deal with today. Um, but once they came off stage, um, they were uh, a little unusual. The uh, in Germany, and I mean, I can always remember, uh, you know, Watty rolling around on the floor with some girl covering her in butter and things like that. I mean while her boyfriend was standing there too frightened to do anything about it. Um, and you know, some of the some of the gigs were broken up with tear gas and Wally banging riot troopers heads together and things like that. I mean it all goes to uh, <laughs> make for an unusual after show party but uh, they were on the whole they were great but I mean they were deadly at the same time. I remember one particular uh hotel in I think somewhere near Stevenage where um I left the bar quite late and went back to the um to my room I got the doors opened on the lift and I could smell that very sweet smell of grass that had been smoked by them and the crew and anyone else who was around uh, the lift doors opened and I got in and it was quite strong I went up to the floor and there was this haze across the lobby and as I walked down the corridor I could couldn't actually see the really the end of the corridor it was quite thick with smoke I went and knocked on the door and you couldn't see the other side of the room it was so full of smoke uh, everything got a little out of hand um, there were some powder fire extinguishers that got let off that night um, and eventually the police got me out of bed at about four or five in the morning and said, get them out of the hotel now. We won't do them for smoking drugs, but there's a woman at the end who's uh, had a heart attack. <laughs> An old lady who'd, um, was, who had this powder. For, I don't know if you've ever seen a powder fire extinguisher go on, but it goes everywhere. And that had come under the door. Um, she completely freaked out and phoned the, the hotel manager who'd come up and gone, what on earth's going on here? Called the police. And I just said, if you think I'm going to take this lot out of this hotel, I had three bands on the road with me. There was the exploited Infra Riot and someone else I can't think of at the moment. I said, if you think I'm going to take them out now and try and sort it out, it's going to be ridiculous. Let's leave it for a while. And cooled it all down and they were fine. I got them out of there about seven o'clock in the morning, which is not a good time for a band to start leaving. Uh, and everything was OK, but uh, it was pretty ridiculous at the time. When you've got the police banging on your door at four o'clock in the morning telling you to get a band out of a hotel and you can't really see around that hotel because there's so much grass smoke. I mean, that was the most amazing part, was that they didn't actually do them for anything. Just said, leave quietly, get out. Probably the weirdest place I ever went with Exploited was to, to West Berlin before um, the Berlin Wall came down. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a very, uh, it was a strange setup before the wall came down because it was, West Berlin was in East Germany and so there was a real paranoia hanging over the city. It was a, uh, uh, a lot of decay in architecture where we were. It was it very much, um, it could have been pre-war Germany really for the, for the, for the feeling of it. Uh, the, uh, I mean in, in, the, in the sense of the decadence, uh, pre, you know, early 30s Germany could have been. Um, and there was a very strange gigs we went to. Um, I always remember this, there were some gorgeous punk girls, really gorgeous punk girls who had rats inside their leather jackets. And I remember watching this girl take the rat out and fr start French kissing this rat. And I thought, I'd never say anything like this, but it certainly didn't happen, you know, at, at the Under Club or the Bridge House or anywhere like that. Uh, I mean, we saw dogs and donkeys at the uh, gigs, but never rats. And this is, so, I mean, there was a real weirdness about it. And, and when the band went on, it just ignited. It was, I mean, not physical violence, but I mean, there was just a real energy running through the place. And it was a, one hell of a gig. It was one of the most exciting gigs I've ever been to. A couple of my brothers were doing this gig in America. I think my brother like shit into this plastic bag. Right, and there's all these Americans that it was in a, it was it? Oh fuck, it was near. What was it? 
fucking mm -hmm. smack. It was something that stayed, I can't remember the fucking name of the place. Now, it was, it was on the stage, I had a shit in his bag, it was like, oh, it was like rabbit droppings there. Eh? Fucking, it's like, so he's like, he wants this. And there's all these cunts at the front of the greedy cunts. And then, oh, I hand, they put your hand out. So this last he put her hand out with two hands. And he poured the shit in, so that's going, <laughs> There's no time, <laughs> no time with a fucking, uh, he pissed in this fucking, <laughs> pissed in this big fucking, big massive joggy fucking lager and that, eh? So he pissed in it all, like, and they go, oh, all these cunts, all the cunts have just been up, fucking, just, fucking, just been wankers. So we said, what, how, what, drink of that? So we, I heard the cell phone, they're like, ah, fucking drink of that away. And Charlie for the subs came in, he's like, ah, yeah, I'll have a drink, and Charlie, do you drink that? He's like, nice, but Charlie's not, Charlie's still holding a drink here, eh? <laughs> I might never do that one, Charlie, yeah, sorry, mate. <laughs> With the fresh metal scene taking off in a big way, bands such as Metallica and Anthrax were mixing ancient heavy metal riffs with the intensity of bands like The Exploited and GBH. With fresh compilations being released on both sides of the Atlantic, punk rock was to be heavily influenced by this, with bands such as English Dogs and Broken Bones pushing the boundaries of punk that much further, leaving new wave punk all but dead. Even today, American bands such as Guns N' Roses and Skid Row use the same attitude which got The Exploited noticed all those years ago. See, the, the funny thing about um, bands like The Exploited is they had much, much greater influence in America than they ever did in Britain. I mean, the American music scene is much healthier. The rock industry in the, in the States is much healthier than it is in Britain anyway. Um, uh, and in America, there was none of the silly prejudice about the, the oi bands or, or, or the, the, um, that surrounded... Um, uh, surrounded them in Britain, and so a lot of a lot of the the, the better of the new wave of heavy metal bands that, that, that took off in the states in the eighties, certainly bands like Guns and Roses, and uh, oh, uh, I can't remember the names of the fresh bands now, but I mean um, they all cited uh, the oi bands, and they cited the Exploited, they cited uh, um, the Rejects and bands like that as being big influences on them. And I think you can, when you listen to their music and how far removed it is from something like Judas Priest or something like that, you know, you can, you can hear that influence, isn't it? Music for Nations, Martin Hooker's new home, signed The Exploited. The band's first release for their label was the Jesus Is Dead EP, the band's first ever 12-inch single. Containing four powerful tracks, politicians featured Wattie making a phone call to the President of the USA some six years before Bono of U2 decided to use the trick on stage. Hello, could I talk to Mr. Regan? Mr. What if I'm exploited? Uh, no, I'm sorry, President Reagan isn't available. Is there any message you'd like to leave for the President? Mm -hmm. Tell him to take care. With another progression in sound, this was the last record formally reviewed by the UK press. By this time, the punk movement in Britain was well and truly dead on its feet. Yet all over Europe and the States, crowds of between 3 and 10,000 people were flocking in to see them. In Spain, the band were even mentioned in the same breath as Michael Jackson and Madonna, and were met at the airport by a national TV crew. Deptford John, according to the Link newsletter, has left the exploited, and it certainly wasn't due to musical differences. John later went on to become Dogs the More Roadie, and was last heard of knocking out Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses. Another live album came in the form of Live and Loud, a bootleg on Streetlink records featuring various lineups from the band's history. I had people in the band before, like they're no, no, they're no committed to the band. Because they're only in it to the, because they want to tour, because they, no, they get to tour out. And they, want to make, they think they can make a lot of money quick. I mean, they're just like, they just end up like, like slapping them and turn the piss off. Right? But like, you've got to be, like, to me you've got to be committed. So you wouldn't want to be committed to the music. And uh, if it wasn't for that, I'd like fucking have packed it in. Packed it in, fucking kill myself, probably. I wouldn't have killed myself, I'd have fucking killed some other kind. <laughs> <laughs> From 87, the lineup changes have been almost as often as the UK subs. With the fresh hardcore sound obviously rubbing off on the exploited, they recorded the almost grindcore Death Before Dishonor album and the worn out 12 inch. With Nige on guitar and Smeeks, who turns out to be the band's longest serving bass player, what his lyrics on the album turned away from nuclear atrocities 
to almost paranoid personal frustrations in driving me insane and pulling you down. A live video was recorded in Nottingham and featured a frank interview with Whitey. The band played a storming gig at London's Dingwalls to a capacity crowd, then furred on a massive bill at an all-day concert with the likes of the UK Subs and GBH at East London's On The Streets gig. Finishing the year with a co-headline with the Angelic Upstarts at London's Astoria, the gig ended abruptly after tear gas was released during the Upstart set. Almost unheard of in 88-89 in the UK, the band played only a few gigs in two years. Two of these, ironically, at the George Roby in Finsbury Park, only a few hundred feet away from the now closed rainbow where the band had been headlining some eight years earlier. This face of death is by far the most devastating. Helpless people were murdered like animals in a slaughterhouse. I personally don't know if this kind of situation could repeat itself, but if it does, we all deserve a life in hell. 1990 saw the massacre, the most sound piece of work since Troops at Amora, due to an excellent production by Colin Richardson and Watty himself. Branching out into almost speed metal, the band's original beliefs were still intact and shown on Sick Bastard, Don't Pay the Poll Tax and Boys in Blue. I think, that, I think they're popular because they've stayed true to their guns and they were one of the great originals and and they're still there and doing it i mean if you what if you still like that type of music there's not that many bands out there doing what they do certainly not doing it as well um and what is still a legend i mean you know, there's no doubt about it i think the high point has really been the fact that there still is a huge interest in the band worldwide and that somebody a group that's now been going for virtually 15 years can still make a living out of it. it you know, I mean, by no means are they rich people, nowhere near, but they can certainly make a living out of um, selling records and touring the world and still manage to go to all over Brazil, Japan. I mean, they were in Israel a few months ago. So there's still a big interest in them. And I think that, I mean, that shows that they had something. I mean, it was raw aggression, but they always had something. I think that's, that's quite special when some, something keeps going, yeah. What he had a lot of, uh, he was, he obviously believed in what he was doing. That's the sort of thing, he had a conviction uh, and he was genuine in what he did. And he had so much energy on stage. Uh, and they, they had such a, a dangerous feel about them that I think that set them out from the crowd really I think that's why people adopted them and, and, and uh, started they, they got the following they got it was because they really were out there on an edge and not a lot of people talk it and don't walk it but they were really really were mad and bad and dangerous to know what about most of the cold though eh? people are a bit more a bit more aware of like, what things was going on about us uh, well, when we started the band we started like with I suppose we did have so many fights that we used to have. We used to fight like other gigs because they put the smashed gigs up. But like now we like, don't do that as much. Mostly it doesn't happen, but like, uh, but like it doesn't happen again. If people try to fuck us about it, eh? then we take the piss. And we just fucking like, stand up for yourself. Uh, but as a band now, like, I, say, I say as a band, the like, only, only difference is from now to when, when we first started it is we're a lot more. Uh, Music, our music's a lot, it's got a lot more energy, but better. It's got, the music's a lot a bit better, a bit faster. But like I still wouldn't, uh, still wouldn't try to change. Still wouldn't try to change like uh, the music. I mean, the music just starts to come from the heart. So it, so it would be like punk music, a bit of a better production. That's, and if, uh, if, you don't, if, you don't, if I don't like, if I lose, if I lose that, they'll just pack the band in. Cause it, cause like, cause people, people, people aren't stupid. Like, people follow the band. They're not, they're not stupid. Like, they know if someone's genuine. And that's why a lot of bands like, uh, what's called, like the Noble League, Chelsea, fucking Stiff Little Fingers, all the bands. Like people know that they're sort of fucking total sell. Eh? They're only there to make money. Like, it's like everyone wants to make money, but like, but you can do it. But to me, like, if in a band, you've got to play music. Like, 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 like you, like you're true to. If you're in a pop band, if that's what well, it doesn't matter. But to be in a punk band, you want to actually, because we're singing about anti-social, other things that are happening to us. So you've got to, 
So like uh, people, people thought they were false. Say they wouldn't buy the records and they come get their gigs. In '92, the US leg of a world tour turned south. One date saw Watty trash a £5,000 lighting rig as a revenge when the promoter threw people out of the club for stage diving. Another date, where a member of the audience attacked the singer, resulted in a free for all leaving Watty with a smashed hand that went septic, needed a week's hospital treatment and delayed the tour. The UK's biggest gig of the year came in the form of an all-dayer at Brixton Academy entitled Fuck Ready. Featuring the exploited further on the built Sham 69 and the upstarts, this gig was followed again by more lineup changes. 93 saw the band preparing for a new album. Tours of South America, Israel, the United States and Europe effectively made the band one of the most travelled bands in the world. Major public interest group for the band again, as new American press darlings Nirvana were to employ Big John as a temporary second guitarist, whilst top fresh band Slayer and rapper Ice-T covered three tracks from the Troops album for inclusion in the film The Judgment Night. This led to the name of the exploited being blurted out on MTV networks worldwide and Punk's Not Dead from the Palm Cove video even being played on MTV Europe's 120 Minute show. Sadly, as with it as MTV claim to be, they still haven't the bottle to do a full feature on the band. August saw the second fuck reading all day up, with the exploited second on the bill of the reformed anti no elite and featured Watty on stage with Animal to do it on So What. Right, like uh, with like Mel Hammer, Kerrang, they're all getting like five star reviews. What to do all these articles because, but before, but for the like three or four years before that, they wouldn't put, they wouldn't put, they wouldn't put any like they were exploited, they wouldn't put and nothing they've exploited, they put gigs, they would phone them up, right, and put the gigs in that and gig dates, they wouldn't put them in, they need time for us. Then when we got that, then the massacre, they, they, they all gave it good reviews because they're fucking good album, and like they all wanted to talk to us, then after. They want to talk to us, so like the record company would phone up and say, well, they want to do an interview, I'd say, who, who? They'd tell us who, I'd say, like, fuck off. Like, because, they, to me, like, they know what time, if you can't, if you can't like, uh, talk to us, or fucking, like, or, like, I've done anything to do with the band, when we're, when we're going through a bad time, then they, they expected, like, fucking jump on the band, when we're going through a good time to promote your paper, or whatever it is. More touring ensued in early 94, with the band going into the studio in June to record their seventh studio album. Hold up in a residential studio somewhere in the deepest depths of Surrey, all was not good. Trivial arguments turned into major rows with the studio's management. With UK street punk still having a roaring success abroad and the still loyal UK following, this album was to be one of the most eagerly awaited in the last few years. In the studios, studios for four weeks, they were had like lots of pro lots of uh, lots of problems with like, people. They're taking equipment out of the studios where there's a it belonged to two people, and like they were splitting up. And like one promised us he wouldn't take the equipment out until we until we finished being there. But they wake up the next day, we would go in and go, where the fuck's all the equipment? You know, this was costing like six hundred pound a day, and so we'd end up like, spending like for three hours like, arguing with them, saying fucking bring it back before we smash you up and that. So. So, but like, so eventually, like, the trouble with the like, with the equipment, like, as well, like, getting the right sound. I must have hired about fucking eight, eight or nine guitar amps and fucking all different stuff and drum kits. And we still, uh, so that was in June '94. Nightmare for you or us. 
With new street punk bands in the UK citing bands like The Exploited as influences and the major music rag's new invention, New Wave of New Wave, the fans' interest in them is still good. However, for the next few years at least, it looks like the future for the band still lies abroad and as unemployment pushes higher and higher and the reason for punk's original existence are more relevant than ever, the band are left to continue to roam the world and sing about issues of real social importance. The UK major music scene lays in a shambles where the youth are content to listen to egotistical American stadium rockers or sit in apathy and listen to the industry manufactured bullshit. Gone are the days when the music was played by kids on the streets and back are the days where kids pay £20 for a t-shirt down Carnaby Street. Punk's dead. Long live punk. Go!